everyone. Welcome back to Deep Dive. We, well, we made this grant in Pennsylvania. We made to the Enchanted Forest. We made to Kansas. And now we're going to New Mexico for a little talk about Frankie Pad. And I can't do it alone with me. I have my good friend Ryan here from Mount Schmodown. How are you doing, Ryan? I'm doing very good, Ben. And, uh, I'll be honest, this show, I was kind of hesitant when you were throwing out these uh, top uh, shows you wanted to talk on, but then the more I could look at that list, I felt this was kind of a good show to talk about, especially with its spinoff series, especially with the spinoff series and the, the, the acclaim it's getting. <laughs> right. Tell me, before we get right into it, tell me, what are your overall thoughts? And your overall, your overall, your main thoughts about Breaking Bad? Um... Well, my main thoughts are Breaking Bad. Um, one, it's definitely one of the best written dramas I I I came across. Now, I came I actually came across the show during its final season, which is funny. Uh, but it gave me a lot of incentive to watch the earlier ones. And personally, I I'm gonna bring it up, and I probably and I might reiterate this later. But personally, I think it was kind of a good thing because seeing everything from the outside and then looking at it from in. It's not. It's kind of like at school. It's I don't know. It's kind of like young. I knew a lot of classmates that whenever they got a book assignment, they like to read the last chapter and then start from the beginning, just so they don't because they'd like to know how it ends. Me, even though I I lucked into it, but still I appreciated watching uh, the writing, the storytelling, all the great characters that came into the show, and. It, and uh, one thing with Breaking Bad, seeing the decisions made by by Walter, and it, it plays so well like a great Machiavellian or a Shakespeare tragedy to where you want... It's not like he's an anti-hero. He's full-on villain. Um, the, the only redeemable part of him is the fact he loves his family. But it's not until on season after season you start seeing his greed become more important to where his family, that, became his, that was his motivation turn into his crutch, his excuse. You, it's it, at this point, I mean, I just remember uh when I got when I got around to season three, and I'm I'm talking too long on my thoughts, but I'll just quickly say that when I got to season three, and I remember reading people's reviews and comments about it saying that oh he's one of our favorite anti-heroes. I go, like, oh, is he? Because he just you don't see what he's done to his family. I mean I mean, of course, I mean, you, we do see how it all comes crashing down in the final season, but even then, like he's already sowing seeds of discord. He's causing distrust. He's putting people under so much stress, all just because finally he gets greedy and he was just too ashamed and there is a regret in his past that he just couldn't overcome, you know. So, right. it's a tragedy. <laughs> well, I mean, and you have to... I know. I think they're the one of those few shows where every single acting performance is top notch. I can't think of a. I can't think of a like weak actor in this bunch. Great character development, interesting stories. Yeah, it hurt me from that first episode on, and the chemistry between. Brian Cranston and Aaron Paul as Walter White and Jesse Pinkin. Pinkin? Yeah. I yeah, Pinkman, yeah. And Pinkman, thank you. It's incredible. I mean, the back and forth, the respect, and at the same time, the distrust between them. It's really interesting, and you can't help but watch and get hooked into the show. And then halfway, yeah. and then season two comes. I think it's season two, and they introduce Gus. Oh, season yeah. four? No, season three. He's introduced. Okay, season three. I'm sorry. I believe season two. There are there, there's hints laid out that right. they're, they're going to meet him. Yeah, I, it, it's yeah. honestly it's been a while. Uh, I should have probably relooked at when his debut episode was. But you are right. Gus did came on in very early in the season. What did you think of Gus as a character? I mean, without a doubt, Gus, great character, gives you, he's kind of the archetype, but then the anti archetype 
of a drug kingpin because you meet him. He's of course when uh, of course when uh, Walt and Jesse keep getting these messages to meet at the El Pollo. Her- oh my God, Los Pollos Hermanas. Oh yeah. Yeah, this shows how long it's been. I haven't. I don't remember the name of the restaurant, but the Los Pollos Hermanas. They keep going there, and then when Walt puts that two and two together, just seeing that manager up front, just being so warm and uh, open to everyone's like, "Hi, yeah," being helping so many customers, and then finally that one on one between the two of them, that small, slight tone change from Giancarlo Esposito, where I'm going, "Oh, this is the man," but even then, then you start seeing more layers peeled back. Season three. When he gets uh, the, uh, the the twins to go after Hank instead of Walt, oh. and then when Walt and when he confronts Walt at that hospital, I mean, for the whole time Walt felt like he was he kept his he kept his life secret, and then he told him, "You're not the only one who lives a double life," meaning that Gus he was never it, this was never a one on one like chess match between the two of them. Gus always had the higher hand. The only why he just came out on the short end. Was either through uh, dumb, I won't say dumb luck, but just through luck and happenstance, like the twins failing to kill Hank. That was because Hank was a, a veteran. He's a veteran FBI agent. He was able to get the upper hand and luck with just having one bullet left in his gun. And of course, Walt being able to at least outsmart because at the time Jesse he was trying to he was trying to stay away from Walt. Walt doing everything he can to protect Jesse just shows like. That's why I love that last episode in season three to where Gus had seen Walt as an equal. But then when Walt made that decision to, you know, to kill the drug dealers and save Jesse, you do see the wheels turning in Gus to where this this became a bad business decision. And of course, tried to get rid of him, bring Gail back on. Then Walt goes, he, you know, he convinces Jesse to kill him, which talk about acting. That moment with Aaron Paul at the door holding that gun and the camera just slowly panning from side to side of Aaron. Like you can just see the intensity in his face where he's really hesitant. He doesn't want to do it. And then that single tear that fade to black and you hear the gunshot. I mean, yeah. Talk about, I mean, Giancarlo is fantastic. And season four showed you exactly how great he can go from how, how he can go from being looking so like, nice and open to complete menacing without saying a word. But he then, it's still good with Aaron Paul. This was his this that, that shows his breakout. Oh yeah. I mean I think out of everyone Jason can't is a hero of the show. I mean you see what he went through season after season. First with Walt, then with Cut. And then with what again? And then with the drug people. You get to see this kid is tortured and he's broken to. He's a relate. victim, a complete victim. Uh, sure, when you meet him, yes, he's a bit of a teenager who doesn't, you know, who sells drugs, but you do see from that opening, he is blackmailed into working with Walt. And from there on in, I mean, you know, he's just some like cocky kid who, you know, who, co- who cooks good meth. But then when you compare his brand to Walt's, where Walt is able to like that scene where he said, it's pure glass. You're an artist. It's like he gets inspired. So when I love the moment when Walt leaves him and Jesse's making meth, uh, pill boy, no, I'm thinking, um, pill, no, doughboy, doughboy. I said pill boy. I'm thinking the good place all of a sudden. But doughboy, he likes the meth, but then that look in Jesse where it says we can do better. You do see that it does tap into where Jesse, he is kind of like, he represents untapped potential, but corrupted. And when he's corrupted or pushed, you see him lose so much. That's why that scene where he's in the hospital, just going back at Walt, you know, he's saying, I'm not turning down the money, I'm turning down you. It's solidified mm-hmm. Jesse as a victim of Walt's greed, of, of, what Walt, of Walt's plans and machinations. And from then on in, it's been Walt just either trying to make do do right by Jesse or control him. Yeah, I mean, and then at the very end of the show, I'm jumping around here. No, that's when fine. Jesse, when Jesse finally gets away and he breaks down in the car, 
You can't help but feel his pain and his relief all at the same time. He will finally be broken away from that entire life. Because you think he's finally going to get a clean slate. He's finally going to make an honest go of it. Yeah. And it is so nice to see. And then, of course, we get the Netflix film El Camino afterwards where it's all about Jesse just trying to get away. I mean, yeah, I like that end to where you where you won't believe Jesse's riding off into the sunset. But I also like with the film El Camino that it shows that, no, Jesse can't walk away. He still he was still a drug dealer. He has, unfortunately, a record. This is just him just trying to get the hell out. Right. And I like how it ends with him getting out. What do you think of what Walter's family? Um, maybe Hank, Walter Jr., and, um, yeah, what, what was his wife's name? Skyler, what do you think of all those characters? Uh, I, I have plenty of thoughts on Skyler, but first thing I do want to talk about is the other of the family. Um, Hank and Marie, who knew that this couple that were introduced in the beginning felt like they were just not right for each other. All it took was a PTSD from Hank to turn him from being a cocky, arrogant cop to realizing, no, this is a good man. He's just good at his job that the cockiness has came. And then, of course, his wife, Marie, who, even though Hank's an FBI agent, and D, no, DEA, why was he's a DEA agent. But then Marie, you know, they're alone. She's alone at the house. And so she's just trying to, she's, she's empty. And she's just trying to fill that void in her life when Hank is just not home. You compare it to Skylar, who has uh, children, you know, a warm family. Well, Marie, yeah, she's living a better in a better house. She doesn't have to worry about find her worry about herself financially. So I do like how in season one we're kind of meant to hate the two of them because they act as you know they kind of act as snobbish and condescending. But I do, but this praises one of this once again praises Vince Gilligan for the writing and the direction they did. They decided to deconstruct the both of them, have Hank go through PTSD after that shootout with Tuco, have Marie going to random open houses and then just stealing things, trying to, and of course, pretending to be somebody else because she just doesn't like her life. And then seeing later on when Hank's um, PTSD and then, of course, his um, insecurities get the best of him. Him losing that, him getting his badge taken away from him, that moment between him and Marie in the in the elevator, that is a great mm -hmm. moment. It shows that these two, they may come off a little. They, they may come off. They may be. They may look like they they're toxic, but they truly love each other. And then from that turn, you go see Marie becomes the dutiful wife, not old school wife, but you do see that she loves Hank. She sticks by him. So when Hank discovers that Walt is the one they were chasing Marie. She's not going to hesitate for one second. She, when, when Hank discovers she goes, she immediately, she immediately supports him, especially when they recruit Jesse. Mm. I do. I do like to see that Marie is 100% step in step with Hank. And also the fact that she also has strong love for her family as well. Sure, she may not have children, but that doesn't mean she does not love RJ. She does not love Skylar. And then later on, Holly, you do see that she has that strong love. And it's one thing I like how it turns, especially out now. They're not victims, though, but I do say that they unfortunately they're just a vic they they suffer the consequences of Walt's actions. And then moving on to RJ, the son. I mean. Jeez, See, seeing how much he loves his father, how much, he, and the fact he looks up to him. I mean, mm. let's be honest. Sure, Walt's an average dad, but to RJ, he's like, he's someone with cerebral palsy. He, he needs walkers to get around. But yet, Walt is giving him so much attention. He gives him so much respect. that Even when the cancer happens, you, you, you see RJ, RJ immediately. He's just like, I want to be there for you like you were for me. And it sucks, too, because of the loyalty he has for his dad. It makes him blind to the actions that Walt's been doing later on in the season. And now it gets me to Skylar. Oh, my. Okay. Next to Jesse, she, too, 
is another victim who yeah. was harmed emotionally and psycho and psychologically by Walt. Now, just seeing how their positions were from the first season as well. Walt, you know, you feel like the hapless husband, uh, Skylar, she's very confident in what she does, almost as if she's wearing the pants in the family, but not exactly, because you do see from that pilot episode, Walt looks like he's kind of, you know, hapless in life. But Skylar, on the hand, she realized we have a son, we're about to have a baby coming in the way. We need money to financially support ourselves. So she's like on top of herself. And then, of course, the change comes where Walt is getting more confident or he's he's becoming, well, he's getting confident in a way to where he wants to, he, you know, the whole story of Walt, you know, he feels like he's been wronged in life. Now he does, now he's getting, now he's getting a taste of power, something that gives him purpose. And, and he's just shoving it back in people's faces in the, in the complete wrong way. And Skylar kind of suffers for it. Best example in season, I think season one or two, Skylar goes to the car wash, believing that Walt had a disagreement with the owner that made him quit. And then when she goes to confront him, the owner tells her the truth. No, Walt stormed out, insulted him and quit. Which means that's what, and Skylar, who's still pregnant, she unfortunately she had to take the brunt of that, a consequence of Walt's actions. And then, of course, um, also, and she also did suffer the consequences of Marie's actions too, when Marie was constantly, you know, when she was shoplifting. She yeah, goes, yeah. Gift that Marie gave her, the, the store accuses her of stealing something. But because, but, and, but the thing with Anna Gunn's performance is because. I don't know what it was, but I didn't get the fan base's hate towards her because that annoyed the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I came from the I came from the last season, and so I was starting backwards. But even then, looking at how Walt is just letting people trounce over him, it's no surprise that Skyler had to step up. But mm -hmm. so many reviews, so many articles, and so many people on Reddit, Twitter. Facebook, we're all shouting that Skyler is the worst character in the show. It, it annoyed me, and I'm going. These people—they're not watching the show. I I mean, do you like do you like it before or after she knew the truth about Walter? Well, knowing the fact that Walter was doing a double life from seasons one and two. It did make you, it didn't make it, I won't say it was easy, but it didn't make you want to hate her. Right. But at the same time, she's trying to be the dutiful wife. She's trying to be the loving wife to a husband who, unfortunately, after the 50th birthday, is doing like what she thought was a midlife crisis, you know, smoking marijuana, hanging with a young punk. But then when you start seeing the lies build on, especially start of season two, when Walt pretended that he had amnesia or in a fugue state. And yeah. then when he comes back, <laughs> yeah, Skyler was not buying any of that stuff. That's to me where I'm going, oh, this is someone Walt can't lie to or can't lie to very well. So when she does figure it out in season three, well, at least that moment when Walt acts, unfortunately, Walt under drugs gives away his, set, his secret cell phone. Yeah. That to me clicked in my brain's like, oh, she knows. Not exactly what he does, but she knows Walt's been lying to her. And so I loved it season three where she goes, you're a drug dealer, and the horrified look on her face, though, like throughout the whole thing. Like at first she just thought, oh, you're dealing marijuana, which during that time it was illegal before it was legalized. And then when he tells her, no, it's not marijuana, it's meth. And then she just gets even more horrified. And she tries to do the smart thing, keep her family away from Walt. But because Walt, and this is the turn, when Walt goes from I'm doing this for my family to I'm doing it for the family. Yeah. Like it, the, the change, it's the subtle changes in Brian's performance and also in how he's portraying Walt. Because in season three, what were some of the major things that happened? Uh, the airplane crash overhead. Um, uh, Walt lets Jane die. Um, he's getting into business with Gus. Walt is becoming who he thinks what a man should be. Not knowing that his family did, his family loved him for who he was, and the fact he's strained so far away from that, and then you see Skylar suffering from it. That's why season three, it was very, it was, it was one of the, it, I won't say unbearable in a bad way, but it was unbearable to watch because every time Walt tried to get back in with his family and Skylar trying to reject him, 
or keep him away to protect them, it hurt every single time, especially with RJ. I mean, he's just trying to be the dude. He's just trying to be the son who wants his family. He wants his mom and dad to be happy. And the fact they have a daughter now, uh, I mean, he has a younger, a baby sister. Just, I can understand how frustrating it is. The dad's trying to protect the family. The mom's trying to protect the son and the daughter. So when she says that line, someone needs to protect this family from the one who protects this family. Mm. Damn. The, 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 the stress and the responsibilities that she was able to put on her shoulders. I mean, her sleeping with Ted and starting an affair with him, unfortunately, that was a bad mistake. And she learns from it. But I do like the fact that when she does join him on his venture, you see that she is just as good as he is. She's just not willing to cross that moral line that he was willing to do. Which is why all these uh, um, moments that everyone loves watching, I look at it with on a I look at it on, in a different light and go, "This is not Walt at his best. This is him at his worst." Like I am the danger. That scene, it's greatly performed. But everyone's going, oh, that's Walt being badass. What are you talking about? He's intimidating his wife. How is that badass? No, not him being, not him being the villain. Not him being the villain of the story. Exactly. And, and um, what, now, this particular episode I'm about to bring up is the finding. I think it's in season three. Might be in season four. The Fly. Sorry? The Fly. Do oh, I remember? think season... I believe season four or three, because this is when uh, he brings J- Jesse... No, no, I think this is season three, because... Mm. Oh, I can't... But yeah, it's when he and Jesse... You know, he brings Jesse finally into the meth, like... I mean, you know, he, he gets rid of Gale, brings in Jesse. Uh, that is a great episode, honestly. The... <laughs> It, it, and it's directed by Ryan Johnson. Yeah. So, and it, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, Fly was season three. Fly was season yeah. three. What are your thoughts about that episode? I mean, what the great, just the, the self-containment of that episode and it being a great character study. I mean, every episode or not. I mean, Breaking Bad is a great uh, is a great way to do a character study of a character. But to but in this episode, seeing how Walt has kind of you know his world is crumbling around him, and the meth lab is the one thing he always had control of. So when the unknown element of a fly gets in, seeing the seeing what he's trying to do, just so. He keeps one little piece of his world in control. It does show you exactly Walt. That's all. That's who he. That's what. That's who he is. He's a man who wants to be in control. It's just his entire life, unfortunately, he's never been in control. And it does. And you do see. And you do see it later on in season five when Jesse asks when you know when Jesse asks him, "Are we in the meth business or the money business?" Then he goes have dinner at their place, and then Walt finally opens up about his previous business with gray matter on the fact that he could have been on the track on the fast track to, to, to us on a successful business. No, he had, he had a stake in a successful business and he could have been rich beyond his wildest dreams. But at the time he was focused on trying to be a father. He wanted to be there for his pregnant wife. So, and he says he, he sells his shares, but that line, he says, I go, I, I look at their stocks every day. That tells me that he that was somebody who couldn't let go. But then also we don't hear. I mean, he gives an, he gives an example. I mean, he says that he was having issues with one of his partners that led him to leave. But you can even tell then that it was an ego thing that Walt he couldn't accept. Maybe it, it to me it felt like Walt his ego bruised him, and instead of you know trying to do the humane thing and maybe patch things up. Like with Gretchen, who I'm assuming, which is the reason why he left Grey Matter, if he had just patched things up with Gretchen, I'm pretty sure he could have still had a controlling stake, and he and his family would have been fine. Therefore, no meth medicine. Because in season to trail back to season one, I think it was season six, episode seven or six where Walt goes to visit Elliot and Gretchen at Elliot's birthday. Elliot 
learns of his cancer and Elliot, you know, being the old friend, old business pal wants to help him. And then Gretchen calls him near the end of the film. And she says, we know the truth. It's not what's going on between you and Elliot. It's between you and me. You can see Walt, it's his ego. It, it, it really shows that there's a part of him that did not want to accept whatever happened. And he's trying to walk away, push that away from him as far as possible. It's something he's trying to control. And then at the end, he goes back to Je Jesse and, and says, you want to cook. That does show to him that he does not want I, – I don't know if it is if someone has leverage over him or just something that was chaotic he couldn't control. But these examples I'm bringing up ties into why the fly is good because Walt gives every excuse to Jesse to kill this fly instead of let it be. Like Jesse said, let's just let it be, protect, make sure it's nowhere near any of the machines that's making our meth, and we'll be fine. It'll get out on its own. It shows the two differences between both of them. Jesse, as much as chaotic as, chaotic as his life has been, he's willing to understand there's things I can't control. So I got to move forward. I got to move forward or roll with it. Walt's like, nope, I am I'm going to control this until it kills me. So that self-destruction, that self-destructive behavior of his. And we do see where it ends. It, it ends up for him. And you briefly mentioned it, my name is Riv. I'm talking about it really quickly. Mm -hmm. Walt let Jane die. Now, to me, this marks the death of Walter White and the birth of Heisenberg in control. What do you think about this? Well, I have two things. Well, the first one I'm going to bring up because it's very important. Um, this goes back to uh, when season five was pre about the premiere. I got lucky. to. I was at Comic-Con around the time. And Breaking Bad was in the Hall H panels, in the same panel that I was in line for for Supernatural. And Breaking Bad was before it. This was the Breaking Bad where Brian Cranston was walking around with a Walter White mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was funny because I was actually five feet away from him when he was taking pictures with people. I I wasn't a Breaking Bad fan. So I'm like, oh, that guy, he's getting all the pictures. And then when he does, I'm going, holy shit, I could have taken a picture with Brian Cranston. <laughs> but... To move on, Vince, during a during a Q and A question of that panel, a fan, some fans, and even the moderator did bring up that moment. And Vince said that's not his moment when Walter becomes Heisenberg. Oh, For really? him, it's the moment when he goes to Jesse after talking to Gretchen and says, "Do you want to cook?" For Vince, he yeah. said that that panel. For him, that's his moment when Walter chose to be Heisenberg. Now, and you bring up a good point with. And, and like I said, I'm just bringing up, this is what I heard at a panel that Vince Gilligan, the writer, the creator himself said. For me, that moment wasn't when he chose to become Heisenberg. To me, he was already Heisenberg. This was just him deciding he wasn't going to let a loose end like Jane threaten his money, his family. Mm. I'm doing this in air quotes. Family. Because throughout this whole time, Walt, he has been ignoring Jesse. He has been, he's pretty much been the cause of his pain. Because in season two, when Jesse gets his own home, when he gets, you know, he becomes a renter to uh, Jane. And I remember it, it, when Walt is pushing Jesse to push to sell more of the meth, ends up getting his boy, um, oh my God, I'm forgetting his name, but. He's the one that gives Je he's the one we, who gives Jesse the van that the, the the RV that they were selling the meth they're making the meth out of. Okay. Uh, and, and, people, and, and, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was because um it ties back to what I said when Jesse was a victim. When April was killed in mm. that episode, and Jesse was heartbroken and he just wanted that pain to go away it drove him into drain jane's arms they became they fell in love with each other but then both of their situations where they became heroin addicts walt was and of course walt not accepting responsibility choosing to push jesse away going yeah you continue to do your drugs just don't let it interfere with our business walt it goes to show that walt he might as well have just shot jane up with the heroin himself personally <laughs> Because Walt, as I said, through his greed of wanting more money, 
Sure, people can say it was desperation because it was at that time when the cancer was becoming more and more pers- more uh, persistent in his body. But even then, mm. it was no excuse for him to not re- be logical of the whole situation because uh, season one, everyone said he was a very logical person. He was always level-headed, you know. But then you realize when that ki- when he's when he learned he gets cancer, he was never a level-headed person. He was just... Mm. I won't say depressed, but I will say that, yeah, he was kind of depressed and he had suppressed his ego for all those years because of the other responsibilities. The cancer pretty much allowed Walt to be himself. And um, we do get from a flashback in season five when he and uh, Skylar go to buy the house for the first time. You do see Walt not really listening to her. He's all being like, oh, this is going to be a temporary home for us when we get things back up and running. It really showed that Walt was always like looking towards his own goals and not the family's. So, um, but to go back in with the whole what I'm trying to talk about with Jesse being the victim, Walt being unable to accept that he is the cause of Jesse's pain, it, it, it became and it only became an issue for him until Jane threatened to reveal his secrets. Mm. And it wasn't, and then of course, by luck, he ends up meeting Jane's dad at a bar. And he goes, and it, it, it convinces him to go back to talk to Jesse again. Now, who knows? If he had not gone there, maybe Jane would have just thrown up on Jesse's back, or she would have accidentally, you know, got a started to throw up and she choked on her own and she started choking, you know, and it would have been Jesse's own fault. Mm-hmm. But the fact that we do, but it doesn't, it changed the fact that Walt was personally there. He could have been the good man to save Jane. But instead, he only thought of the short-term fix for his solution to let her die, not knowing the long-term repercussions of what came. Because he is emotionally destroyed. Um, Her dad is emotionally destroyed until we learn later on he's a traffic controller that leads to the destruction of and then, and unfortunately, because he goes back to work not emotionally ready, he ends up causing the death of hundreds of people in two plane crashes, and the destruction, and and then debris falling over New Albuquerque. Walt being unable to accept that he can't control things is what led to Jane's death. That's why I feel that Walt became Heisenberg. Now, of course, this was me knowing that fact from Vince Gilligan. But it was also season two when Walt can tells he tells the therapist the truth. I lied about not remembering things. Even to me, that's like that 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 further proved that Walt, this is him choosing to be Heisenberg because he loves he doesn't want to give up that life over maybe just accepting he can't control things and be with his family. No, I mean really all really good point, Jen. You can compound on Jesse being the victim. There was that great scene at an AA meeting where at first he's going there to scam them. Mm-hmm. And then he finally breaks and he's confessing them. And you can see the pain in his eyes when he's saying, I, No, I'm not here to. So you met him. It's heartbreaking. It really is heartbreaking. And you see that damage that what to write at this life is causing this young man to go through. It's, it's also, an, once again, another repercussion of Walt's. It's also another consequence of Walt's actions, asking, forcing Jesse to kill Gail when Jesse, at that time, could have been emotionally on the mend. Because sure, he got he, sure um, he comes out of the hospital choosing to reteam with Walt again. But even then, this was Jesse to where he realized that he didn't need Walt, but he wasn't aware of that just yet. So when Walt convinced him, like, yeah, you gotta kill him because this was yeah, this is Jesse on two points of an emotional breakdown. One, uh, the he was he, you know he's he started a relationship with um, and on Andrea, learning that her oldest kid was responsible for killing eight ball and he and jesse trying to be the good guy 
and trying and convincing Gus to 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 not have kids sell drugs. And then of course the drug dealers, their own solution was to kill the kid. So seeing the fact that Jesse once again sees himself as a bad guy because he, he inadvertently gets a kid killed, he was gonna he was gonna risk losing his life to kill two drug dealers. And then of course because Walt did that solve for him, he unfortunately felt morally obligated because he owed Walt. Seeing the fact how Walt, um, uh, the fact that Walt had used that to convince, I mean, he didn't purposely use it, but because Jesse remembered it, it made him kill Gale. And then, yeah, that breakdown when he says it, I mean, I like how he's going, where he just says, yeah, I ran over this dog. And well, of course, I do like that there are some people who were kind of judging him for it. And Jesse, he's already judging himself because he knows what he did. He wants to feel shitty about it. And then therapist. I, I mean, the, the 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 group leader, the, the the speaker. I understand he's trying to tell Jesse what he wants to hear, but he's not. And so I love it when he says, I just accept it. I should just accept it because I'm a great guy. I like how Jesse realizes. Uh, I mean, I like not just the acting, but the writing where you do see two moments with Jesse in that speech. And what, and I didn't even bring this up when we when you brought up the fl- the fly episode. When at the point at the and later in the episode when he and Jesse are just mentally exhausted and drained trying to find this fly, Walt does say that there, he has this moment of clarity, where he realizes his end is not going to go the way he wants it. That moment is equal to Jesse in that meeting realizing, I am not a good guy. He wants to be. That's why I like the fact he admits in that room, I'm trying to convince you addicts to take meth. I, and I, I really even like it when he tell, yells at the leader, like, do you accept that? And he just goes, no. And he's like, about time. To me, that's him. He wanted to be judged. He wanted to look, be treated like, sh- he not treated like shit, but he wanted to make it look like I did something bad and I shouldn't be forgiven for it. I mean, yeah, and when um, I, I'm trying to think, we should bring yeah. up, we should bring up that character that was, I believe, was introduced in season two. Oh, yeah, I know what you mean, Mike Airman Trout, yeah. Well, I'm going to go to Oh, season. no, Saul, that's right, Saul. Both of them were introduced in season <laughs> Yeah, we're not talking about both of them. What do you think about Mike and Soul? Well, first off, Bob Irwin Kirk. God, man. <clears throat> the fact that you take this drama, I mean, Mike, I mean, everyone, uh, I knew Brian Cranston as a comedic actor and maybe a few dramas, but because he was being such the straight laced character, but I do like what Saul were introduced to him, the experienced lawyer who, you know, the criminal lawyer, and you do see how he just knows, I I loved how he's just like, look, I know a guy that can do this solid for you. I know a guy for this. And like, yeah, he's there for the comedic moments, but it never doesn't, it doesn't really cut short of the tension. It's one of the things I like with how when you, if you have a smart writer, not smart, no, when when you have a project in the right hands, you have a character written in the right hands and then directed in the right hands. Saul never takes away anything from a scene he's in. He only either he's on par with it or he elevates it, which is why I like it when he's on screen. Uh, seeing how he's just trying to be the guide for Walt and Jesse to be like, look, you guys can't be these, uh, you know, uh, nickel and dime, nickel and diamond people by selling the meth. You got to go wholesale that way. You have a buyer, and then you can work on mass producing your supply instead of just be like, oh, I got all the surplus. How are we going to create the demand for it? <laughs> you know, you know what the character Sean Goodman in the show reminds me of? He's kind of like if Jiminy Cricket was evil. Like, he's that kind of. I'd say more. I'd say morally uh, corrupt, personally, because Saul. You do see yeah, yeah. there are some. There are some things that Saul. There are some lines Saul will not cross. He won't right, cross. Right. 
And you do see that when Walt gets more and more um, villainous in his run. Like Saul, he's understanding. Yeah, I'll get you out. I'll, I'll bend rules. I'll use the system to make sure you don't spend any jail time. But as long as nobody gets hurt, he's fine yeah. with that. Like Saul is on board. He's just this one guy. He's kind of like, whoa, he's in this world. He, he knows he can control. But at the same time, he knows that he can't control it. So he's always trying to find a way to, you know, save his own ass, which is why, at least until season four, he was always one step. But he was at least a level up on Walt. But then when Gus was gone, you do see that he's trapped. He's trapped, unfortunately, with a monster of a, one his own making. Two, he allowed into the into the world, and three cannot escape. Right. And we can talk about that guy that Saul introduced. Um, oh yes. One to two. Mike. Uh, well, Mike. Yeah, Mike. Ugh. What do you think of Mike? Mike. Oh, Mike Erman Trout, possibly one of the best additions. And it turns out, um, uh, one fun facts I did learn about the show. I'm pretty sure you know Ben. Like, uh, first fact, Jesse. Uh, he Vince has said this in interviews. He meant to kill off Jesse in season one, which he's glad he changed his mind on. And two, Mike Ermintrout was a late addition because that moment when Jesse calls Saul for help with, to do with Jane in the script, it was originally meant to be Saul that goes to Jesse's home and not Mike. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Well, I, I mean, I learned about that myself. And just seeing how a new addition he was and the performance that Jonathan Banks gives, just like the moment he wow. goes up there, he is in control. It's it's pretty much, this is the wolf. It's Harvey Keitel's the wolf right. in a low, but in a low stakes setting. He's not there to prevent, he's not there to help you get rid of some, uh, of a, of a snitch that you accidentally blew the brains out of. No, he's helping you to, Prima, he's teaching you how to cover up and protect your own ass while he deals with clearing up any evidence you were there. And the fact you learned he was a, he was a cop in the past and that story he tells to Walt about the half measure and full measures. Oh, man. Yeah, and the more, the more and more you learn about him, even from Frankie Pan or even from Pentecostal, by that time, his life ends. In season five, you feel for him. You feel you. This character has lived a whole life. He has his granddaughter. He has his daughter-in-law. Yeah. And you, you need feel for him. I mean, he he understood his place. He understood he's a dirty cop, but then at the same time, he's most likely a brute and a fixer. So he was going to put himself in a position that got him financially success, that helped him. In which in turn would help his granddaughter. See, he's he's honestly uh Saul, Mike, and Gus are all three aspects of Walt's person of Walt that Walt sees himself as. Uh Mike is the man who believes in family, who Walt thinks that he, he is. Like Mike's the family man. We do learn in Breaking Bad, he tries to be the family man, but you know, his son, his you know, he loses his son, so he cares about the granddaughter, and pretty much. When Mike says everything he does is for his granddaughter, he means it. Right. So it's heartbreaking when all of a sudden, when Walt calls him and said the cops are coming after you, he has no choice but to leave his granddaughter. He has to abandon her. Yeah. That was heartbreaking. And then, uh, oh, no, no, go ahead. I'll continue. No, I'm, I'm, I'm you. Okay, well, I was going to say, uh, to draw back on Gus, Gus is the ruthless businessman that Walt wants to be, the one who is feared, which Walt does later become, but it's clear that that's why he created the, the Heisenberg persona. He wants that name to be feared, which is why that moment when he goes to Tuco and he's there in control of the situation where this is not meth, oh. that's exactly what Walt wants to be. <laughs> but, uh no, he won't be a bad monster and all that. Yes, yes, yes. But that moment when he throws the not met and the explosion happens, 
That is an incredible moment. What did you think of that moment? I loved that moment. I really loved it because this was for the longest time while he was just trying to, you know, be at a distance, be a manufacturer. But, of course, we did see earlier in season one he had no choice but to get his hands dirty on two occasions. One, killing those drug dealers. Uh, two, with the whole acid dissolving of their bodies. And then yeah. killing, um, I forgot the name of the of Hank's uh, informant, but killing him too. But then, but but it's that moment where he does go full Heisenberg, walks in there, understands this. That's the one time where he takes responsibility of what happened to Jesse through his own actions. Right. He goes there and he's like, "Look, you owe me not just for the meth you bought, but also for his pain and suffering." And you do see Tuco. That is an embodiment of a wild card. Where he's just bragging on how much he beat the hell out of somebody for some drugs. And then Walt, being so calm, he just goes, you get, you got one thing wrong. And then when he does that, I love the fact where he is, I mean, he this is at the point where he has the cancer. He believes he has nothing to lose. So he had no problem. I believe he would have thrown that whole bag on the ground just to prove a point. <laughs> and it ties, it, like I said, it ties into the badass he wants to be. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is not episode, same episode where he shaves his head, right? I believe so. Yes, it is. And I think that shaving of the head, I think that's a metaphor for him starting to embrace who he has to become in this world. I do. I do think that as well. Um, because before on then, he was kind of just... Um, I won't say hesitant to accept him going, him, you know, him getting cancer. He, he knew the cancer was coming, but it was kind of like once, it, like before I said, his, his need to control things. He realized I can't hide this, so I'm going to control it. So when he walks in with that shaved head, everyone, I mean, the reactions of Skyler, RJ looking at him like that, that just showed to me that this was a new man. But knowing that, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, oh, go ahead. I, I forget who it was. Somebody called him Lex Luthor. And a part of me was like, yes, can we get him as Lex Luthor, please? That <laughs> been... That's right. I think that's where it, it, it inspired people for going, oh, yeah, Brian Cranston for Lex Luthor, the whole campaign. I'm going, go campaign as hard as you want to. He may not take it. He wouldn't have been a great Lex Luthor, old man. He wouldn't have been. He probably would have, but this was around the time where I think he did not want to be too tied into that typecasting that he of the character of Waldy created. Or he just wanted to break. I mean, not everybody wants to play the same character type over and over again. <laughs> um. Well, as, as we start to write down here, we, we might as well talk, Sean. What are you... What have you been thinking about Better Call Saul? Uh, I have, I got to stop you right there. I got to make a confession. I have not watched the whole thing. I've only seen maybe five episodes of the first season. That was it. Oh man, you're missing out. You're I know. Missing out. But this was at the, But this is also like I don't have exactly cable for the for the you know for something like AMC. So. I have to wait till like the sea. I mean, I, I do have streaming so where I can watch the whole seasons. It's just, you know, never finding the time or the interest to com continue watching. <laughs> well, in, well, in going into the final season, maybe wait until after it finishes and then watch all of it because it's a damn good show. And one of those spin offs that Almost passes the original show, if that makes sense. I have heard that. I have heard that the show has really good, like, it does a great job of being a prequel, but then it does an amazing job of really uh, elevating its material. Yeah. It really is going to be interesting to see these two shows back to back when everything is finished. 
Is there anything else you want to touch on, Ranking Man? Before There's we... so much, so much I want to talk about this show, but I know with the limited time that we that that you that you want, I will say that Breaking Bad. I remember when it was popular. That show, because there's that on-running joke that everyone kept either recommending you two shows, and it was either Breaking Bad or The Wire to watch. That on-running joke to where everyone's just like, "Why are these still? Why are you keep recommending me these shows?" And then I watch Breaking Bad, going, "Oh, I understand why. Like, I understand when you get good television. It's just more of, do I want to watch a show about a father who descends into villainy? And it, on paper, you think no, but it's not until you maybe you give maybe." An episode Breaking Bad, personally, I think it's a show where you need to give at least one season a go. If you don't like it, that's fine. It's not like where everyone says, Oh, watch one episode and you'll get hooked. Sometimes the episode they watch may not be the best one. That's why I recommend at least watch a season of a show. If you have time, watch one season. If you like it, great. It could be your new favorite. If not, you gave it a shot. That's why I say with Breaking Bad. Anybody watching this now, I recommend you at least give Breaking Bad a shot. The first two seasons are very truncated down because this was during the writer's strike, so they couldn't really do a full season. But even then, the limited episodes they have, still great television. And, you know, I think in my opinion, it comes down to the writing, and comes down to the characters, and then coming down to the acting. And can we look at the acting? And, and, and hey, I'll, I'll say it straight up. In my favorite show of all time, uh, nothing else has come close to it for me personally. Yeah. Now, having said all that, Ryan, where could everyone find you, my man? Well, everyone can find me on Facebook. You know, you can uh, send a friend request to me, uh, Ryan Payne. You can yeah, so from there you can like message me through Messenger or hit me up through Twitter where we can have conversations. Like if there's any, if you want to hear more about my thoughts on Breaking Bad, that's one way you can do it. Uh, oh yeah, Twitter uh, Twitter handle uh, caramel underscore pain. That's definitely where you can find me. Uh, you can also find me on the Northern Entertainment Group YouTube channel. Pretty much as a guest star or a special talking head for whatever shows or segments they have brought up. And I have a podcast. If you're a wrestling fan, or if you're a wrestling fan, or you have a shared passion for wrestling, the podcast that I co host with my buddies Brenton McPherson and James Shimo is called Wrestling Ramblings and Rages Podcast. It's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Breaker. Uh, Anchor and Stitcher. We are we actually do have episode. We do have new episodes released. It's not weekly, but we do release new episodes each month. Right now, we have episodes where we did a, a top ten. Where myself, Brenton, and James did a top ten list of the best wrestling pro promos from our perspective. Not it, not like objectively. This is all subjective. And then we also have a few other uh, topics we did uh, as well. Myself and James, we did a top ten list on wrestling stipulation matches. We also did we also do predictions for wrestling pay per views. So if you just want to hear our banter, check it out. Uh, like you can follow us or leave a comment. You know, we really want to see how we can improve ourselves on our podcast form. And hearing feedback get, is a long way for us. All that on him. Dude. And you can you guys can find me at my Twitter pen on the show radio. You can find me on Deep Dive every Monday on Chennai Academy every um Wednesday, Wednesday yes. And um good news, I'm bringing back online, so that's coming back on Sunday nights over on this channel. So more information about that and you can also find me at the Northern Entertainment Group on Rewind That Tape and Northern Countdown. Until next time on Deep Time and everything else, this is Ben. Have a good one and see you next time. Thank you.